morning. My name is Richard Vise and welcome to the launch of the NICE five-year strategy. During today's event, we will be hearing from senior members of the NICE team on the changes they have planned for the coming years and why now is the time for a new approach. After the formal presentations, there will be a panel discussion and that will be your opportunity to put your questions to the NICE team and understand what this strategy means for research, industry, clinical practice and patients. And you can download the strategy now on screen. And also, if you uh, shrink down your viewing box, you can then uh, use the form to submit a question. But before we move to the, uh, the presentations from NICE, I'm very pleased to welcome Lord Bethel of Romford, the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Innovation at the Department of Health and Social Care, to deliver the welcome address. Lord Bethel, over to you. Richard, thank you very much indeed. Good morning. Uh, it's a massive pleasure to be here to mark the launch of NICE's five-year strategy. It really is. And I want to pay a massive tribute to NICE for producing a strategy that sets out a clear, compelling and ambitious blueprint for the future. It's a strategy that builds on NICE's success, but recognises the urgent need to adapt in response to challenges and opportunities. This strategy will ensure that NICE remains as important five years from now as it does already. Securing this legacy is absolutely vital. In the two decades since it was established, NICE has built world, a world leading reputation for the vital work it does, driving improvements in the quality and value for money of health and social care. Securing this legacy, uh, I know that NICE is the envy of health systems around the world. I count myself as one of the luckiest life sciences ministers around to have such a fantastic organization. Thanks to NICE's work, many thousands of patients have benefited from access to effective new treatments. And I'm particularly proud of the way that NICE puts evidence-based decision-making at the heart of health and social care. This new strategy has been created in the midst of a pandemic, a health crisis that has meant that we've had to radically change the way we do many things. Throughout this period, NICE has been incredibly successful, collaborating closely with partner organisations across government, the NHS and industry. It's been working in new ways and at, a speed, and at speed to adopt novel and repurposed medicines more rapidly to deliver better outcomes for patients. This work has been absolutely central to the identification and rollout of medicines, such as dexamethasone, that have radically improved the treatment of COVID patients. NICE has also played an incredibly important role in ensuring our response to COVID-19 was driven by the evidence. NICE's rapid COVID-19 guidelines have guided best practice in the care and treatment of patients. In fact, NICE has issued 24 rapid guidelines since the start of the pandemic, a real achievement and one which sets the precedent for a more ambitious future. NICE has the most NICE has most certainly risen to the challenge of tackling COVID-19, and for that I pass my utmost thanks. However, the pandemic has also exposed our weaknesses like never before. There's no denying that our healthcare system faces some pretty big challenges. Challenges which, as this strategy rightly recognises, NICE has been instrumental in solving. Too many people are still being diagnosed far too late, experiencing undue delays in accessing healthcare and spending too many years in ill health. And with an aging society, these problems only get worse. Two thirds of adults over 65 are expected to be living with multiple long-term conditions by 2035. And these burdens fall unequally across our society. Regional life expectancy varies by up to 10 years, 10 years and there are significant regional and demographic vari variations in things like obesity rates. These shocking levels of health inequality have been hammered home by COVID-19. Alongside the unacceptable human costs, these trends are already placing a huge burden on our health and social care services. We must tackle this growing demand in a cost-effective way whilst we recover economically from the impacts of the pandemic. And we must act now. 
We're standing at the brink of a revolution in healthcare, driven by data and analytics, new cutting edge technologies and treatments from genomic medicines to AI enabled diagnostics offer fresh help, hope for the future. We, we absolutely need to capitalize on innovation to pivot our healthcare system from one which focuses on acute late stage intervention to one which embraces preventative treatments and technologies and supports early intervention. And this involves all our partners from across the system, from ensuring that the UK has one of the most innovative, innovation-friendly regulatory environments in the world, to capitalizing on the lessons learned from COVID-19 to embed a pro-innovation culture across the NHS. NICE will need to step up to help deliver our ambition. And this is why I welcome this ambitious strategy. It will see NICE become a more agile, flexible and dynamic organisation driven by data and supportive of innovation that can drive improvements in patient care. To give you an example, I absolutely welcome the strategy's focus on rapid, robust and responsive technology evaluation. NICE has world leading expertise in assessing the clinical and cost effectiveness of medicines. And we know that many companies rightly see NICE approval as a kite mark of quality and value for their treatments. The vast majority of NICE's assessments now result in a positive recommendation with recommendations regularly published very close to or even before licensing. This is a great outcome and it's aided by a new commercial flexibility enabling more treatments to be made available to NHS patients more quickly than ever before. For instance, just last month, NICE announced that babies with spinal muscular atrophy would benefit from new and potentially curative one-off gene therapy. While patients in the UK with rare cancers have been among the first in the world to benefit from CAR-T therapy. These achievements are thanks to the hard work and flexibility of NICE, NHS England and Improvement, and the companies involved. They build on the successful Cancer Drugs Fund that has provided early access to promising new medicine for over 56,000 cancer patients and now routinely is delivering faster access to cancer drugs, up to eight months faster than in some cases. That's going to make all the world of difference to some patients. But we must do more. The strategy rightly commits NICE to working more closely with industry helping more companies to better understand and engage in NICE's processes. New technologies from artificial intelligence to genomics to, to hybrid technologies are increasingly exciting, offering opportunities to revolutionize the way we do healthcare. But this will challenge our way, established ways of working. We need our systems to be capable of responding to them so that patients can benefit we must ensure that NICE's strength in robust evaluation does not impede its ability to make rapid responsive decisions, as this strategy notes. And we must be world leading in our commitment to welcoming the most effective and innovative medicines and technologies, supporting our ambition to make the UK the most forward thinking and prevention focused healthcare system in the world. I also want to welcome NICE's second commitment, to ensuring guideline recommendations are dynamic, rapidly incorporating new information. Whilst NICE guidelines have long been recognised for their rigour and authority, they've also been seen as slow to respond to new developments. So I am excited by the ambition that this strategy sets out to make NICE guidelines into living documents that respond rapidly to new evidence and innovation. This goal will go further to increase the value of guidelines to frontline healthcare professionals, helping to drive cost-effective innovations into the NHS and ensuring that they deliver real benefits to patients. Thirdly, I wel welcome the strategy's commitment to driving faster implementation of its recommendations. We need to get better at making sure that innovative medicines get into the hands of patients across the country. NICE's recommendations can only benefit patients if they are implemented and I'm very pleased that NICE is setting a clear ambition to maximise the impact of this guidance. This will surely ensure we are ready for the future, with innovation at the heart of patient care and the best new technologies and treatments made available to patients and clinicians faster than ever before. 
Finally, I am, of course, thrilled by NICE's renewed commitment to being scientific leaders driving the research agenda across health and social care. The UK is a world leader in scientific research, and it is right that NICE should step up to take more of a role in guiding this work towards areas where we are currently falling behind. By capitalising on the possibilities created by work, real world data and data analytics, strengthening its patients and public engagement, and building on collaborations across industry, academia and government. NICE will continue to be a global leader in evidence-based decision making. Now, a common theme running through the strategy is NICE's plan to embrace technology to drive efficiency. This vision to transform the way NICE produces and presents advice, making better use of new digital technologies and artificial intelligence, will make NICE guidance much more user-friendly something I know that the Secretary of State is particularly supportive of. So by way of closing, can I say that I am truly excited by the strategy that, that NICE is launching today. It is a strategy that builds on NICE's world leading reputation while reflecting the need to constantly improve. NICE can't solve all of our challenges, but it has an integral role to play in driving innovation and improvement, which will ultimately help the nation's health for decades to come. This crucial work will help ensure we are ready for the future, a future which prioritises prevention, puts innovation at the heart of patient care, and ensures the best new technologies and treatments are made available to patients and clinicians faster than ever before. I now urge NICE to redouble your efforts to deliver this timely and ambitious strategy, and I look forward to continuing to work with NICE as you do so. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Lord Bethel, for setting today's discussion in the broader context of the policy and healthcare challenges which we're all facing. So I'm now very pleased to welcome Sharmila Nebajani, the NICE chairman, who's going to give the background to today's strategy. Shah, over to you. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Minister, for your important perspectives uh, on innovation, uh, on guidelines, and indeed on the ambition you place for the NICE of the future. As Richard said, I'm Shamila Nebrajani, uh, the chairman of NICE. I took up my role in May of last year, and I'm delighted that so many of you have managed to join us for this, our official launch of our new five-year strategy. Uh, Richard told you that you can click to download uh, the document and I hope you will do that. Uh, the document explains our ambition for to transform the way we work while staying true to our core purpose of improving health by putting science and evidence at the heart of health and care decision making. NICE, now 22 years old, is internationally respected as a beacon of evidence-based medicine and it's, and it's the nature of our sector, of course, that the external environment has changed in each of those 22 years. But witness the pace and the extent of change over the last two or three. The rise of digital technologies, the growth in algorithms and machine learning, the 100,000 genome project, to name just a few, it has been remarkable. But then consider the last 12 months of this pandemic. The change has been extraordinary and its effects irreversible. It is my strong belief that NICE needs to develop new powers of agility and adaptation in the face of such change so that it can continue to provide evidence-based leadership and support to our health system. Our new strategy seeks to recognize and anticipate the changes ahead, plotting a path for our work over the next five years. In developing this strategy, we talk to many of you on this call key opinion leaders, external stakeholders, patient groups, partnership organisations across health and social care. Thank you all so much for taking the time to talk to us. From those discussions, we identified six key challenges, and I think those are going to appear on a slide uh, just shortly. The first of those is the rapid pace of innovation in health technologies. NICE's health technology assessment has traditionally been organised across streams of work in drugs, devices and diagnostic. 
Each field is now generating vastly increasing numbers of new products. So in the future, NICE needs easily and speedily to identify and prioritise for evaluation those that will have the greatest impact for patients, ensuring the most innovative and effective medicines are available at a price taxpayers can afford. Beyond those traditional areas, as Lord Bethel said, are significant new innovations in medical technologies, in genomic medicine, in ATMPs and digital health. The lines between technologies are increasingly blurred. The world where drugs are accompanied by a companion digital app in a hybrid product is already here. So as well as streamlining NICE's evaluation pathway, we need to develop cutting edge flexible mechanisms that can accommodate new and hybrid products, yet are rigorous and evidence-based to ensure our recommendations are trusted. Challenge two is digital. We are in the midst of a digital and data revolution. Digital technologies powered by machine learning algorithms will become core therapies in health just as software as a service has transformed how organisations work, software as a medical device is on our near horizon. Just think for a moment how often the software on your phone updates itself. Extrapolate that to a digital health product. When machine learning enabled medical devices become prevalent, NICE's linear evaluation processes will come under strain and we will need to develop new dynamic approaches to evaluation and to the evidence base that underpins it. We all on this call recognise the power of the randomised control trial, but the most innovative products that bring new possibilities for patients also bring new uncertainties. NICE will respond to this channel challenge with a new focus on assessing how a therapy works in practice using real-time, real-world evidence, helping the most innovative and useful products to be launched easily in the health system. Challenge three on that slide is about care models. Care models are changing all around us. The advent of the integrated care system will bring significant changes to the way the system is organised and how care is commissioned. Traditional boundaries between health and local authority organisations will be dismantled with the aim of better integrating care for patients. The rise of shared care, health as a true partnership between the patient and their healthcare professional is here to stay. And in short order, most likely assisted by digital technologies, self-care will become widespread. These profound changes in care model will alter how and what NICE is commissioned to do, and in the end, who consumes its guidance. It requires a renewed focus to ensure our guidance is up to date, is easily understood, is adopted, and its effectiveness evaluated. Challenge four on my little wheel there is about increasing collaboration across the system. As the Minister said, COVID-19 highlighted the importance of collaborative working across the UK's health and care system. We need to combine resources and capabilities to benefit people's health and their well-being. We recognise that the agile collaborative work approach forged within the pandemic must endure and be extended. We will work with key partners to ensure that speed, agility and flexibility become business as usual as we develop integrated living guidelines on priority topics across health, across social care and at the public health interface. Challenge five is the drive to tackle inequalities. The pandemic really threw into sharp relief the health inequalities that exist in our country and Lord Bethel referred to some of those data really um, uh, hugely concerning. Whilst health inequalities has always been a theme of NICE's work, we, like others, patently have more to do. We will aim to play our role in reducing inequalities by prioritising those areas of guidance and appraisal that target specific populations or conditions where there is the widest variation in practice or outcome and where we know the interventions can have the greatest impact. The final challenge on my wheel there is the economic one. The next five years will be a period of tight fiscal constraint, a shrinking financial envelope for the public sector, 
and an increasing focus on efficiency, on eliminating duplication and on optimizing practice. NICE can help in two key ways. Firstly, commissioners will need to make difficult choices. NICE's work can support by providing clear direction on the technologies that are effective, that provide good value for money and should be funded, and clear advice on those that should not. Secondly, at NICE we recognise our ability and indeed our responsibility through our guidelines and through our decisions to foster innovation and its adoption for the benefit of patients and also for our country, helping to make the UK a destination of choice for life science companies as we forge a new future post the pandemic and outside of the EU. So six key challenges. But the one thing we know for certain about the future is that the world never quite turns out as predicted. So above all, our strategic approach is to ensure NICE is agile, flexible, and dynamic to meet the challenges we see ahead, but more importantly, to be confident that NICE can also respond to those challenges we do not yet see, but we will inevitably beat. So having set out the context for this strategy, I'll turn to our Chief Exec, Julian Leng, to set out our plans in more detail. Thank you. Many thanks, Shah, for setting out those six big challenges, which give such a, a sense of urgency to NICE's uh, strategy for the coming years. I'm now very pleased to welcome Professor Gillian Leng, the NICE Chief Executive, who's going to explain the broad structure and objectives of uh, the five-year strategy. Over to you, Jill. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Shah. It's an exciting time to be leading NICE. I took over at the start of the first lockdown and the pandemic response created challenges for all of us. But one thing it did do was absolutely reinforce the need for evidence to underpin an effective, to underpin effective treatment regimes. And as part of the pandemic response, I was really pleased that NICE was able to provide guidelines to inform clinical practice in a much accelerated timeframe. And we worked with partner organizations to ensure a rapid assessment of any potential new drugs for the management of COVID-19. And I'm really pleased that we've built this flexibility of approach and of timeliness into our new strategy. So in future, we can continue to support rapid access for patients to effective innovative new treatments. As we move forwards, we will absolutely ensure we protect our robust independent approach to evidence evaluation and assessment. And we are committed to ensuring that NICE continues to be a world leader so we can play our part in ensuring an improvement in health and well-being, both across the UK, but also globally. But our ambition for speed and efficiency, as well as robustness and independence, mean we will have to transform some key elements of how we work. Our new strategy focuses on the four pillars that Lord Bethel has already mentioned in his opening remarks, and I'm just going to remind everyone of what those four things cover. Now, the first pillar is the delivery of rapid, robust and responsive technology evaluation. This will include flexible methodologies to support assessment of innovative new products. And we've already begun thinking about this in our significant ongoing review of methods and processes for technology assessment. But there is more to do if we want to be flexible and responsive, and if we want to be able to address the changing needs and the changing technologies that Shah set out when she spoke just now. We want to include the specification of ongoing data requirements, which will help us allow earlier access to promising products where there is uncertainty in the evidence base. Secondly, we want to create dynamic living guideline recommendations. We want to have a portfolio of up-to-date guidelines for frontline practitioners and make sure that these guidelines rapidly integrate the latest evidence 
and incorporate new technologies where we've recommended them so that they're available for frontline staff in a useful and usable format. And Paul will talk about this more shortly. Thirdly, we want to achieve effective guidance uptake to maximise impact. This is crucial as there's really no point in us producing wonderful guidance if practice doesn't change and patients don't benefit. We can't do this on our own. So we will work with partners to help reduce the barriers to the adoption of new technologies and refresh our implementation strategy. This will include work with national partners, including the Care Quality Commission, NHS England and Improvement, and the Accelerated Access Collaborative, <clears throat> but also work at a local level, particularly with the new integrated care systems to support their work on integrating health and social care. And finally, the fourth pillar, we want to demonstrate clear leadership in data, research and science. This includes helping to drive the research agenda. As part of our work, we identify the gaps in the evidence base and we need to make sure wherever possible that the research supports the filling of those gaps in the evidence. We want to set out robust methods for using real world data so we can bring that into our approach in the future. And we want to publish environmental impact data on new technologies. The COP26 summit in Glasgow later this year is a reminder of the importance of the climate change agenda, and we want to play our part in supporting that global initiative. So we will, of course, underpin this strategy with a significant internal development programme to ensure we have the right resources in the right place to deliver on these future plans. And finally, the key to delivering this strategy will be collaboration, working with partner organisations, probably many of you who are watching right now, building on the existing relationships that we already have in place and forging new ones to expand our skills, our capacity and our capabilities. It'll be a busy but a positive future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill, for explaining those four pillars which uh, are the, at the centre of this new strategy. And there's a great deal there to unpick, which we'll come on to during the panel discussion. And indeed, a number of questions are already coming through, so do please keep submitting your thoughts, uh, which I can then bring to the panel discussion a little later. So I'm now pleased to uh, welcome Minda Boyson, the Deputy Chief Executive of NICE and Director of the Centre for Health Technology Evaluation. And uh, Minda is going to talk about what NICE's strategy means for work with industry and how that's going to help bring innovative treatments to patients more quickly. Minda, over to you. Thank you, Richard and uh, Shar and Jill. I, I too am very, truly excited about our new strategy. It positions NICE in the UK at the forefront of anticipating and evaluating new and emerging technologies, leading to world, uh, world leading, leading to world leading assessments of value for the system and improved access for patients. For industry colleagues, this should mean that we see a real incentive to invest in research and development of cutting edge life sciences innovations in the UK. We will be speeding up the evaluation pathways by engaging early with companies and health system partners to identify the scientific advantage, advances that have the biggest impact. We will work closely with colleagues in the MHRA, NHS England, NHSX to develop a lit runway for innovative new technologies, drawing on the experience of the work we have been doing during COVID and the launch of the innovative licensing and access pathway. We will increase access to promising and val valuable new technologies by managing uncertainty and risk through investment in our data and analytics capacity, our interest in real world evidence and participation in managed access funds drawing on the great success of the Cancer Drugs Fund and the development of the new Innovative Medicines Fund. 
we will of course maintain our robust and rigorous and trusted approach to health technology evaluation, expanding it to a keen interest in managing technologies from bench to bedside. I'm particularly excited, as Shar has also mentioned, about the opportunities we have to develop solutions for new and emerging technologies, cell and gene therapies, digital health, and genomics. We will develop state-of-the-art methods and processes for fast, flexible, and forward-looking evaluation of these technologies, supporting early patient access and delivering true value for the NHS. So if you're in industry, what will you see from NICE in these next five years? You will see a new front door for the life sciences that will guide you to the relevant programs and services to support your journey to market access. This will include a dedicated office for digital health, connecting NICE's offer for artificial intelligence and software as a medical device with those of other system partners, government, industry, and academia. You will find an intense collaboration of effort with other partners in the health system, the MHRA, NHS England, NHSX, through the innovative licensing and access pathway. And you will find commissioning flexibilities to support early patient access. You will be offered different routes to NICE through our evaluation processes, depending on the evidence you have available, the decision risks involved and the opportunities to resolve them. And you will experience new approaches to how we value health benefits, how we deal with costs incurred by the healthcare system or indeed saved, how we look at new technologies, our greater receptiveness of real world evidence and a clear emphasis on sustainability and health inequalities. You will see NICE expand its role as an enabler of market access, an honest broker of price that represents value for money to intense liaison with payers, commissioners and purchasers for a wide variety of technologies from drugs to devices, diagnostics and digital. We've made enormous progress over the last 20 years. As Lord Bethel referred to, most of our recommendations when it comes to health technologies are positive and provide true patient access. We provide a steer on value when it matters at the time patients and their clinicians are deciding about treatment. And we're open to offers to amend value propositions. I would say we really need your help to deliver on this strategy, together with our staff and uh, enormous contingent of committee members. We need to do it together, and I am very truly excited to, uh, to support it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Minder, and bringing out that really important theme of collaboration and partnership, which is going to drive so much of this strategy over the next five years. And finally, in this section, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Paul Crisp, the director of the Centre for Guidelines. And Paul's going to talk about plans to develop living guidelines on priority topics. Paul, over to you. Thank you, Richard, and good morning, everybody. And thanks to Shah and Jill and uh, Lord Bethel for the introduction. Our ambition is quite simple. It's to produce dynamic living guidelines for a learning health and care system. People are at the heart of this strategy. What we want to do is have a much better offer and integrated recommendations to give people evidence-based practical improvements to their lives so that they receive the right care at the right time in the right place. We will do that through three ways. Firstly, we will simplify what we do. We'll identify the gaps and the links between the recommendations that we make to make it clearer what we're saying in specific topic areas. Secondly, we will streamline what we say. We currently produce guidelines as individual standalone publications. We'll prioritize, we'll concentrate on those questions and decisions that people want to address. And we'll structure our recommendations in ways that are driven more by what our users want to know, what decisions they need to make. And thirdly, we will speed up. By grouping different guidelines and different recommendations together, we can be more agile and more responsive to the priorities that people have. 
This will mean we need to work more closely with our users and with people, public, patients, and understand what really matters to make the difference in terms of their health and care. The output will be a more integrated suite of guidance that will integrate other elements of NICE's information portfolio. For example, linking across to content that we have with the BNF and with clinical knowledge summaries. We'll take a modular living approach to clusters of recommendations that work across the interface between clinical care, public health and social care. And we hope that this will be more meaningful and usable to the integrated care approach that's being taken going forward. What will people see different? You will see our guidelines updated more rapidly on those key topics that matter most. You will see a greater focus on user input and how our guidance is presented. And you'll see linked recommendations and interactivity and availability on different platforms, all of which will still be underpinned by robust, trusted, open, transparent methods and processes. We've learned a lot in the last year with our approach to COVID, and some of that we can take forward in our approach to other key priority areas. I'm happy to stop there, Richard, and I look forward to questions from uh, the, the people on this, on this webinar. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Paul. And indeed, we do have a, a couple of questions coming through very much uh, relevant to, to this area of work. So now I'm going to move on to our panel discussion, and I'm very pleased to say that we're joined by consultant physician Dr. Hugh McIntyre, who's medical advisor to the NICE board. And uh, Hugh, among other uh, interventions, will no doubt be bringing a sort of what, what it's like at the front line for, for NICE's work and how it's relevant. And uh, questions already coming through, as I mentioned, so do please keep contributing. Shah and Jill, I'd like to begin with you, please. And really your reflections on the last year. What did the pandemic teach you about what NICE needs to deliver for healthcare and the strengths and the challenges that your organization faces? Uh, Shah, can I begin with you? Yes, I think, um, as I said in my opening remarks, what, uh, what, what the pandemic shows is the key need to work more flexibly, to work speedier and to work in collaboration uh, with other organisations. COVID, in a way, allowed us to, to, to discard the things that were not truly beneficial to our endeavour. And that's what I mean when I say we need to make sure that those advances endure uh, in our work going forward. I think the other critical thing that COVID showed was, you know, if you want to go and speak to your GP, you use the use video conferencing or use the phone now. So digital health interventions are here and they're here to stay. So it's been a huge catalyst in the system uh, for the way in which we think about uh, health, but also a huge expectation from patients that these advances are here to stay. And I think organisations uh, need to reflect that. I think my final comment is the one on inequalities. You know, I live in Brighton, um, just down the road from me uh, is Hastings. It is inconceivable to me in this country that a man in Hastings will die 10 years earlier than the man of the same uh, health background living in Brighton. And I think COVID has shown those inequalities in stark relief. And we all in the healthcare system need to do more to tackle that. And NICE, I know, recognises that and we want to play our part. Jill, how has the last year shaped your approach in this strategy? <clears throat> Well, as I said uh, in my introductory remarks, we have learned a lot during the last year and uh, it did it did re reinforce the need for an evidence based approach to showing what worked. And I am really, really proud of the staff who worked so hard, who collaborated so well with colleagues right across the research agenda internationally to pull on evidence from around the world and to produce guidance that people really needed. It really was a stellar, a stellar piece of work. And 
amongst all of that, we obviously had to change some of the things that we did. You know, our, our, our several week long consultations, for instance, we couldn't do that. And people were so brilliant at responding to us and giving us comments in a really rapid time frame. Now, I know that that approach won't endure as things are not so pressurized, but we must maintain that agility and that speed and that collaboration as we move forwards. Paul, can I come on to you? What's the right, how do you get the right balance between that dynamism which we've become uh, you're so used to over the past year in terms of the response of the healthcare system, but also the, the rigor and the scientific evaluation that you need to bring to bear on your work? So I think um, where we need to start is we, we, we're not going to change that rigor, Richard. Um, and uh, that's really important that people understand that, you know, the, the, the key here is to have the same rigor, but we need to prioritize. Um, and we need to choose the right topics, the areas where we can have the biggest impact. You know, the, I think, you know, Charles has mentioned it again, that issue of health inequalities. If we can prioritize on national priorities, um, the areas where there's the biggest uh, population healthcare burden, those areas where there's the biggest unwarranted variation in outcomes or the quality of care, then we can make the biggest difference. Uh, we can also look at the, uh, the, 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 the steps in developing our guidance. We can still retain those steps, but we can get quicker, slicker in, in how, we, how we do that. So I don't see it as, a, as a, um, an either or. Uh, I, I think we can still focus down on what, what matters uh, and be more efficient in how we uh, uh, get people's input on our guidelines and still ensure that we have that rigor. Hugh, this more dynamic approach, approach a more prioritized approach to guidelines, how will that support clinicians to do their work more effectively? Thank, thanks, Richard. Um, I think it's very interesting what we've heard. The one word that or two words come out for me. The first is this idea of uh, communication, connection and communication, these two words. For me, what matters is that guidance is relevant. Uh, what I need in my practice now is right topic at the right time in the right format. We've heard a lot about how that will happen. But if I just kind of want to drill down a bit as to my understanding of how it goes forward. Relevance in terms of topic is to populations, practitioners, and increasingly, as Charles talked about, individuals and self-care. And I think that in itself uh, will take time to, to, to come through. Um, but the approach, as my, my understanding is, will be through cross-discipline committees. So whereas hitherto there's been a diagnostic topic looked at by a relatively closed group of people, uh, the intention now is to have much wider involvement in standing committees that include not just professional and practitioner organisations, but voluntary organisations uh, across health and care. And as Paul has talked about, it is it is an evolution from what's happening now. It's not abandoning anything that's going on, but it's being much more about aligning the impact uh, to the gaps that have been identified, targeting the need and the gaps in practice and an outcome through a focus guideline. So I think in terms of relevance, in terms of topics, that is hugely useful for the practitioners on the ground. We've seen it with COVID to be able to translate this into patient benefit rapidly. Timeliness is the second thing. Guidance needs to be available when it's needed, not a two year program repeating itself every five years. And I think we've clearly heard that that's not the intention going forward. It's a big challenge. Uh, it will take a lot of work. But I think if there was something that was close to the clinical interface, relevant to the situation you're dealing with, that would be hugely useful. And Shah's idea of the way apps update, I think, is an attractive way of conceiving how guidelines might bring in the latest evidence and iterate forward. And the third bit of the usability for me that makes this work is format. Um, one hears criticism of guidance sitting on shelves of piles of paper and so on. And I think uh, the idea of moving away from not just a flat paper record to a non-disease based, but kind of clustered set of guidance, let's say cardiovascular, which it wouldn't just be hypertension or heart failure or whatever. It would look across the realm. It would identify the problems it would be something that was speaking to social care and to public health as well as to just healthcare. 
And I think this then starts to reach the wider determinants of health that we heard about and the idea of prevention from Lord Bethel. So it's those three things in terms of topic, time and format. Uh, and, you know, we've heard a little bit about how the usability actually in the environment. So the idea of how guidance is presented will be relevant to the environment of the user. And again, Shah talked about this idea of self, self care. Um, so I think we'll see a movement away just from hospital and bedside and home and bedside to the individual and guidance as a tool for the individual for themselves. And I think all of that holds genuine promise, actually, for a very different way of using guidelines. Thanks, Hugh. I now want to move on to how we get innovative technologies to the front line faster. And I'd particularly like to talk to Mindert and, uh, and Shah. Mindert, you, you talked eloquently about the collaboration with industry to, uh, to bring innovation through faster. The NHS has a pretty patchy record, uh, at best perhaps, of, of adopting innovation, spreading it across the system, not just in particular centres of excellence. How can NICE help the front line and institutions take up these new technological opportunities? Well, first, just to connect, thanks, Richard, to connect to the, to, to the comments made by Hugh, is that we have to be clear about what the expectations are around our guidance. And when it comes to technology evaluation, they don't, they don't, they shouldn't be seen as standalone recommendations. They fit in a pathway of care. And we need to make sure that what, whatever happens in my uh, uh, programs connect properly into what the guidelines program is doing. So that's what, that's one aspect. Two is I think I think implementation ought to be at the forefront of our thinking. So when we develop the guidance, that's when we should already be starting to think about adoption, and not see adoption as a as a as a an event that happens after the guidance has been published. So planning and understanding early what needs to be done is a, is a, is a key aspect. Second key aspect. And thirdly, there are already very, very significant collaborations that we can tap into. So there's the Accelerated Access Collaborative that has uh, promoted a number of tools to help the NHS uh, implement uh, our guidance. There's the Innovation Scorecard that tracks uh, the, the success of, of implementation. <laughs> And there's now in, in the MedTech side, a, a funding mandate specifically directed at ensuring that our guidance is taken up by the, by the service. And of course, there are rapid uptake products that are already identified by the Accelerated Access Collaborative. So I, th I think a package of care that starts early, uh, thinking about adoption when we develop guidance, communicating, uh, what we want from the service and then fitting it into the existing mechanisms will help. Thank you. Shah, you've got a, obviously a major leadership role in building that collaboration with industry and of course you've got your wider perspective on medical research. As, as chair of NICE, how are you going to drive that collaborative approach? Well, I think in any collaborative approach, the first place to start is by sharing uh, understanding and sharing vision. And as, as chairman, I think of myself as, you know, an ambassador, not just for NICE, but for the innovative uh, agenda within the UK, uh, engaging with partner organisations, with patients, uh, with clinicians uh, and with companies. I mean, I think um, to just draw some of the threads uh, together, if our exam question is how do we get better and quicker at identifying the most innovative innovations, assessing them quickly, implementing them quickly, and then understanding their effectiveness. That is, in a way, that is NICE's job on earth, and that is what this strategy uh, is designed to do. I think as an organisation, uh, we are uh, we are organized by centers and that is really good for the rigor and the scientific evidence base with which we approach our conversations. But as products become more hybrid, the organization will also need to become more hybridized. Minder and Paul will forgive me for describing them as becoming more hybridized, but we need to work in a much more seamless way. And the very important thing that Minder said, that when we take a decision about a technology, it is in our uh, guidelines instantly, it is available point and squirt to clinicians at the point that they need it, is a really uh, important way 
of generating that agility in the adoption uh, of innovation. I would like to say two other things. You know, NICE is a is a uh, an information or driven organization and all uh, information driven organizations also understand how important user feedback is to tell you how the information is being used what works and what doesn't and i see that as a critical next development for nice so we are hearing from clinicians this worked really well more of this this did not work so well change this that much more dynamic way of thinking about our informative role in the system rather than, let me characterise the thought, the thought uh, publishing um, some guidelines and sort of stapling them to the website. So those are some of the big challenges uh, that we have uh, ahead of us. And I see within NICE uh, colleagues and within the system, huge appetite for the sort of developments that we're talking about. So I'm hugely positive about the, the challenge that we face. Gillian and Paul, we've got a number of questions coming through about the issue of inequalities, both inequalities uh, in itself and also between physical and mental health care. Uh, Gillian, a striking feature of the strategy is a really strong commitment going right the way through it to tackling health inequalities. But what in, in reality can a regulator, can NICE do to, to address it? Hmm. <clears throat> it's a really important point, Richard, and uh, the pandemic has absolutely thrown the issue of inequalities into sharp relief, hasn't it? Uh, if you look at NICE's original work, if you look at NICE's principles that underpin what we do, tackling inequalities has always been front and central in the way that we do our work so that it's, uh, it's fair and balanced. However, there's always the need for reflection and to consider if there's more that we can do. And that's why you'll see it set out in the strategy. So what we will be doing is reviewing our methodologies, both for the guidelines work and for technology uh, appraisals to see whether there is uh, something more that we should be doing to prioritise inequalities or indeed technologies that might be able to help the system address inequalities. But importantly, we will also be looking at the work that we do around supporting uptake of inequalities, because uh, it can be that the, the rollout of something new is not done in a way that addresses inequalities and perhaps the healthier in society get healthier and sadly other groups lose out. So that's an area that we need to focus on. And indeed in the past, we've also had some specific guideline topics that have looked at how we address inequalities. Whether we will do that in the future, we, we need to explore with our partners and perhaps that's something Paul might want to pick up on. Paul, what's the impact of tackling inequalities going to be on guidelines? And also what will you try to do to redress the balance between physical and mental health uh, thanks, Richard. So, yeah, just going back to the point about what we can do to tackle um, health inequalities, we, we we look at health inequalities now, we already do that, but I think we can make a much stronger effort to address those questions and those topics that have got the biggest impact on health inequality. Um, and, you know, if we do the right guidance, uh, in the right way and answer the right questions. So what are the big um, decision points in, in people's care across uh, the interface between public health, prevention, uh, clinical care, and their, their social care needs? What are those threads that we can pick up and say, okay, here's, a, 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 here's an area where we can make a really big impact in terms of an area of updating our guidance or in terms of a, a new referral, so a new piece of guidance that might, uh, NICE might be asked to do. So I think in terms of topics that we concentrate on, it, for me, is probably the, 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 the greatest opportunity. Um, physical and mental health, um, again, you know, we have a, a, a huge portfolio of, of um, uh, recommendations that look at at all aspects of care, taking into account people's physical and, and mental health. Um, and it, it, again, I think there's, there's more we can do to, for example, consolidate all of our recommendations um, around mental health topics. So if you think about, well, um, at the moment, 
uh, people have got to navigate through a range of different different guidelines to to find what we say about a particular particular topic. But if we could if we could consolidate as we're planning to do around those big um, uh, priority areas, you get a much clearer you get a much clearer picture of the the hot spots of where we should be concentrating our efforts. Uh, for example, around around mental health provision. So. You know, again, for me, it comes down to the simplifying and streamlining and speeding up. We can simplify our portfolio to concentrate on the things that matter. We can structure it in a way that makes it more accessible. And we can, by doing so, that will help us. It will set us up to respond more quickly to changes in people's needs and people's priorities and also changes in the evidence base. Minder, can I come on to you? You raised the issue of sustainability in, in your short address, and there have been a number of questions come through on that, such as how does NICE help the NHS achieve net zero by 2050? Is it practical to work sustainability into your technology assessments? And if so, how will you do it? Well, it, it, it we have to do it, don't we, Richard? The, the, this, there's almost no, no option. Um, and I think it starts by making sure that everybody uh, accepts that premise. Uh, we would have to we have to start small, perhaps just asking our colleagues in industry to provide us with the information they have already available, and present that to our independent committees, so that they can at least absorb the information and understand how it might impact on their thinking. I think it will be a lot more complicated if you ask me the question about what would be the trade-off between sustainability and health. Uh, and that, that's, I guess, where we have to do a lot more work. And indeed, our colleague, uh, Felix Greaves, of the Science, Evidence and Analytics Directorate, is looking into how, how you might want to answer that specific question. That's more about valuing impact on sustainability uh, and trading that off against health outcomes. I think that, so that will be a lot more difficult. Could you see a situation in the future, just as you do at the moment with with cost of uh, treatments for, for life years, could you see a position whereby a treatment would be not approved because of its sustainability impact? I don't think that's the, well, that, that might, might be at some point, but I don't think that's a realistic choice, is it? It is within, I would see it much more realistic to think about a, a set of technologies in an area of interest where there will be some trade-off between technologies uh, rather than saying, well, we're going to completely deny investing in, in a technology because I don't think that on the basis of it, uh, it, it not having a, enough of an impact on sustainability, I don't think that's right. But it will be a differentiator in my mind between technologies in a, in a class, for example. Right. Um, Hugh, we have another big system change. Uh, going through at the moment with the uh, move towards integrated care systems. How does NICE guidance and NICE's general work make itself relevant to that drive for integration? Thanks, Richard. I, um, I think it's worth appreciating that this change is, is important uh, and, and very significant. In fact, it aligns with a lot of what we've heard to do with a different approach to care. Um, so the emphasis through the integrated care systems will be on the long term plan. It will be on populations, it will be on prevention and it will be on, as I think Jill talked about earlier, um, health and social care working side by side and duty of integration. So it's a very, very different environment. And then there'll be integrated care partnerships, which will be between providers, primary care, secondary care, voluntary organisations. So even if you just start thinking about that and start hearing what we've heard about NICE's new approach, it starts to, you can see an alignment, you can see an opportunity uh, fostering partnership, integrated partnership work around pathways, around guidance. You can see quality standards coming into the ICS approach as commissioning is reshaped actually very differently. And prioritisation around major population issues will sit at possibly two different places. So I can see an alignment immediately there and an opportunity because there'll be a new set of languages, there are a new set of discussions and that provides new introductions and entries into getting guidance into practice. Um, so I think 
I think it's a great opportunity, actually, and I think it all speaks to everything we've heard. It's all about relevance. It's all about timeliness. It's all about what are the issues at place and at system that need to be addressed. And if NICE can get in there, set the conversation, involve the individuals making the conversation in the prioritisation and then back round the loop out into embedding it in practice, I think there's considerable opportunity for ownership the whole way through uh, because NICE can't deliver that final mile. It, it relies upon others providers, voluntary organisations and so on. And so I think this connection, this communication, this partnership really is a genuine opportunity um, that, that presents itself now. Paul and Mindo, we've had a great... Shah, please come in. Sorry. I'm not sure if you're uh, allowing us to say it, to add to yes, others, but yes. I've, asked, I've asked to add. I just wanted to come back in on some of the points that Hugh uh, and others have made. I mean, it seems to me that uh, we are on the cusp of a big change in not just the care model, but in what we mean by health. So we've touched a little bit on prevention. We touched a little bit on diagnostics, early detection and screening. And in a way, what we're saying is we are changing. The health system is changing from from care for sickness and tackling illness to thinking about wellness and tackling prevention, early diagnostic and early screening. And those things are critical threads for NICE. And I think we are reflecting them in our technology appraisals and in our guidelines in the new strategy. But they also speak to the change care model, the shift to self-care and, and the critical drive to tackle inequalities. So I just didn't want us to lose that thought around prevention, early detection and screening. And actually that was going to place quite a lot of challenge in the system. So some difficult maths there in the economic analysis of the system and some difficult challenges for NICE as it thinks about how it evaluates those technologies. But that is uh, front and centre of, of the strategy that's set out today. And I just didn't want us to, to lose yeah. that thought. And presumably that that's inseparable from helping the system recover from the pandemic and we, when we look at future demand and so forth. Exactly so, exactly so. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Paul and Mindet, we've heard a great deal over the past year about real world evidence and that's clearly been a, a vital part of so much of research and, and, and clinical practice in recent months. You talked about it in the strategy. How will that be worked into your decision making and sort of evidence analysis? Uh, Paul, if I can start with you. Yeah, thanks, Richard. So uh, uh, when I introduced our ambition, I talked about uh, living guidelines for a learning healthcare, health and care system. And implicit in that is the notion of that feedback loop, that link to data. Uh, and that link to real world evidence. Now, it's not that we're starting from a blank piece of paper. We already use uh, real world evidence now in some guidelines, depending on what the question is that we're trying to address. So for example, we're exploring um, some stroke national audit data for the stroke rehab guideline update at the moment. We're looking at um, prescribing outcomes um, in mental health for some of our uh, our mental health guidelines so again just just some some live examples there so we're not starting from scratch however what we now need to do is make this more systematic and more embedded in the way we work and again we've mentioned uh, our colleague felix greaves um, felix leads the science evidence and analytics uh, team here at nice so it's it's building out some of those relationships again. It's another key theme in the, in the strategy. Who do we need to work with for uh, those big um, buckets of for routine data collection um, that will help us build that in in a more routine way into our particularly our updating of guidelines. For example, uh, in uptake and impact, that's already been mentioned, but also patient experience you know what's what's the what's the patient view of um the implementation of some of our guidance and how do we feed that in to tweak right. and nudge and shape our updates thank you i want to bring that patient perspective in with uh, jill and sean just one second and mind briefly if you would how will real world evidence come into your work 
in three ways in in the medical devices met tech side we already uh, see a, a great reliance on real world evidence there's only in only 42 percent of the cases we use randomized controlled trials so that's one area where we where we continue to rely on real world evidence we will have to rely on real world evidence in our drug uh, evaluations where we have small effects in small populations it's 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 we we cannot expect randomized control trials to be done in those scenarios. So we I I suspect there will be a great deal of real world evidence used there. And thirdly, in managed access into in, in into track tracking new technologies when they are used, when we take a risk on uncertainty early on, but we follow patients through the cancer drugs fund or other scenarios uh, for a period of time and collect data on their on their on the benefits of those technologies for them. Thank you. Now, Gillian and uh, Shah, we've had a lot of questions come through about patient involvement in NICE and how NICE is going to strengthen the voice of the patient in its work. Uh, Shah, perhaps if I can start with you in your sort of le leadership uh, role as, as chairman, how are you going to ensure that the patient voice is heard loud and clear at NICE? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's very clear already that the patient uh, voice is well represented within uh, within NICE's work. Uh, patients are represented on committees. Um, and so they are embedded, I think, in the conversation that we have. But there is more to do. And, you know, in a way, we're talking a lot about patients when we're all of us patients, but we're all of us members of the public, right? So I think there's something about making sure that the public voice is fully integrated in the work that NICE does, whether we are people or whether we are patients often uh, at the same time. Uh, we've got a new project called NICE Listens, which is really trying to get under the skin of, for some of the most uh, pressing issues that we face, what is the public's view about the trade-offs that we make? What is the public's view about some of the decisions that we take uh, on their behalf? And I think that's part of a very, very important um, engagement, involvement and listening role for nice to hear uh, what patients and the public uh, think. I think the second thing, of course, you know, I said it in my opening remarks, is that medical treatments and the medical system is changing. We already have shared care where the patient is absolutely uh, the partner, the key element of um, healthcare delivery. And I really believe we are not very far away from a model of self-care where many of the therapies that people experience and use may not be mediated through their uh, through their clinician or through their doctor. And so when we think about guidelines, we need to make sure those guidelines are useful to not just the professional community, but to patients and the public. The internet has democratized information and NICE has to do the same thing. It has to democratize the information, the guidelines that it produces to reflect these great realities of um, an open, porous relationship with patients and the public. Jill, I know this is something you're passionate about in cross both health and social care work. Um, how do you intend to make sure that voice is heard loud and clear over the next few years? <clears throat> well, as, as Shah said, we always have made sure that patients and the public are involved as part of our processes, and we very much want that to continue. The Nice Listens initiative, again, that Shah mentioned, is central to getting a, a public perspective on some key questions, and the first one of those will be inequalities that, that we've already mentioned today as being important. But we will also look at our methods for gathering patient evidence and see whether there is more that we can do there. Lots of things have changed over the last few years and we want to make sure that our approach is cutting edge. And it may be, I can't, I can't guarantee this, but as we have our living guidelines online, I would like, if we can achieve this through the technology, a way for there to be ongoing feedback from the pa from patients, from public and from professionals, so that it's not just a here's a closed consultation, but there's an ongoing way of people providing feedback, as we many of us expect to go online and to provide uh, reviews and comments. That's quite a challenge to put in place, but I think it would be great if we could do that. So, so, th so that's sort of patient input. But in terms of what what we deliver, very much hope that this strategy will mean quicker, easier access to proven and promising technologies that 
the public and patients can be confident that their practitioners, their healthcare professionals are basing their decisions on up-to-date knowledge and that we support shared decision making moving forwards. The new guidelines platform that we are we are gradually exploring and rolling out will very much facilitate shared decision making at a practical level between a healthcare professional and a patient so that they can explore the underpinning evidence base in a much more streamlined fashion. Yes, yeah, interesting both yourself and Shav highlighted that shared decision making and the, the, the patient role in managing their own care, which I'm sure we'll see a lot more of through your work. Just in the, the final closing minutes, I'd like to invite each of you just to give your final reflections in, in perhaps sort of 40, 50 seconds each. And just let us uh, have a picture of how you would like NICE to be viewed in five years' time. Uh, Hugh, perhaps if I can start with you. Thanks, Richard. Um, I think there's two parts to this. There's, there's the science of NICE. We've heard a lot about. We've heard a lot about technology. We've heard a lot about evidence. We've heard a lot about innovation. Um, and getting that right and getting it out and relevant and timely uh, to the people that use it, be that the population, the clinician or practitioner or the person, I think is fundamental. But alongside that, I think in my mind, the art of NICE, we've heard quite a bit about reaching the public and we've heard about listening to the public and serving the public interest. And I think understanding what matters to the public in all of this would be really important. If the aspiration is for self-care, then starting to have that dialogue now and the nice giving reasons for what it does and why it does it. Because I think all this starts to become part of that extended loop that I talked about, but it's not just about doctors or practitioners, it's actually about the individual the person, the public. And so the art of nice for me, leadership and the art of nice in five years time to equal in the science of nice, I think would be uh, a great outcome. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, useful, usable and used. So- Excellent. <laughs> uh, I, could, I could unpack each of those but but you know if you think about um say what's happened to to how we consume music you know back in the day you'd go and you'd, you'd buy an album you'd have to take it home to play on a device that was made for that now if you think about it now the, the unit of of how we consume music is uh, the individual track and it's ubiquitous it's streamed um and you can curate your own playlists you can put things together however you want depending on how you wish what you want to listen to in your context and you know in five years i think we need to be uh, i'm not saying we're going to be the new spotify but you know we need to be in a similar position we need to harness digital to give that level of interactivity and uh just link into people how people consume information to to influence uh their behavior so we get that evidence to make the biggest impact on people's care uh in a much more efficient way thank you mind it i think we should be uh, continue to be an enabler of the conversation about value in a robust reliable and responsive way to make way for new technologies to enter the market while at the same time supporting all the existing innovations that are already available. Thank you. Sha. Um, well, we've written a strategy that sets out uh, what we'd like to do over the next five years. And I think that is uh, very ambitious. Um, the nice I would like to see in five years is one that not only is confident enough to deal with the challenges that it recognises, but is sufficiently innovative, agile and um, uh, and flexible that it can take on the challenges it doesn't yet know around the corner. Because in five years, the world that is coming at us is not predictable from where we are now. So it cannot be incremental. We just need to have the confidence to have a go at tackling the challenges we don't yet know are ahead of us. And I feel we can do that. Thank you very much. And finally, last word to you, Gillian. Thank you, Richard. I'd like NICE to be trusted, respected, and an absolutely vital and responsive part of the healthcare system that bridges the gap between global developments, national ambition, and local need. Thank you. Can I thank uh, Lord Bethel, uh, Shah, Jill, and the, the whole NICE team for today's presentation of the five-year strategy. NICE is very keen that this conversation continues and uh, we'll hear your thoughts and feedback 
uh, as the weeks go forward. And we'll also try to answer questions offline uh, that we didn't get a chance to cover today. So thank you for joining us today. I hope you found this a valuable presentation and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much.